Hello, everyone. This is Ed Brenniger. Welcome to the Eddy Network podcast. And my guest today is Parisa Fania, a coach and among other things, who I love the way she has positioned her work. And we're going to hear all about that today. So welcome, Parisa. Thank you for being here. And um, tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, whatever you want to say. It'll be great. And uh, it'll give us something really dynamic to talk about. Oh, thank you so much for inviting me to join you today. I've been looking forward to this for for quite a while. The fact that I'm actually here, I'm just kind of blowing my mind a little bit. Here we are. Uh, so who am I in this life? I'll tell you what my 25-year mission is. My 25-year mission is to be the world-renowned advisor and coach to modern badasses and the world-renowned advisor and coach to the people who lead modern badasses. Who is a modern badass? They are leaders who go 80 miles an hour in a 45 mile an hour zone without checking to see if their people are strapped in for the ride, let alone interested in the destination. Uh, they're like well-meaning bulls in China shops. They don't mean to break as many dishes as they do, even though a lot of those dishes are quite ugly. So if you were to ask me live examples of badasses, I would say change agents, visionaries, disruptors like Steve Jobs, like Ruth Bader Ginsburg, like Thomas Edison, like Serena Williams, like Malala Yousafzai. We don't have to like who these people are individually, uh, and yet we can still see the impact they've had on all of us, the gifts that they've given to all of us simply because they are present and known in our lives. So we know about these badasses. I worry about the ones that we'll never meet either because they've been sidelined, they've been silenced, or they sidelined or silenced themselves. You know, an instance of them being sidelined or silenced is um, their companies didn't know how to leverage their gifts, or they didn't know how to um, share what their intentions were, or who they are as people, um, so that the vision they have for what they create in the world would be known and supported. So... The, and the reason why I'm so passionate about these people, I should say, is I am that person. I was the person that didn't know how to fit in in my corporate life. I was that person who was confused. I was that person whose intentions were good. And I also recognize in retrospect, I was that person that didn't know how to ask for help to be better understood. And also in retrospect, I see how the people that I worked for, the leaders in the organizations that uh, that I was in, they didn't know how to lead or inspire me either. And so what would be different? What could we create for all of us if we allowed these badasses to be who they are and still belong in larger communities or larger organizations? What magic gets created? What, what gifts do uh, that get created in the world when we allow people to be who they are and everyone understands each other uh, better than maybe what they, they could be understanding each other? That's fantastic. I love, I love the way you characterize this because I think there are a lot of people who have the desire to step forward, but they've always been shoved aside or shoved to the periphery. Uh, they've they've been forced to live in the shadows, uh, you know. And and I think that if, if my assessment is correct, that part of the part of the difficulty is that we live in a a world that is so dominated by structure that it doesn't really allow for people to spread right. their wings and do things. Right. Uh, uh, based on their own initiative. I mean, that's, you know, that's the, that's kind of the principal thing that I focus on. So, so tell me how people, first of all, how they, 
how they realize that they are one of these people that you're describing. What's what are the kind of the signs that you're not like everybody else that you don't want to conform that you want to be a what you call in your book is called modern badass a by a modern badass how how do, how do they see that uh, thank you so much for asking that's a great question so I have a self styled field of modern badass anthropology and I have uncovered fourteen traits that oh. allow me to see who these people are. One of them, I, I said earlier, they go 80 miles an hour in a 45 mile an hour zone. Uh, another one of the traits I like to call, there's no crying in baseball. Uh, so not only is it a yeah. wonderful line from a great movie, yeah. what it speaks to is uh, their love and delight of iteration. If one way doesn't work out, try it another way, try it another way, try it another way, really speaks to a growth mindset that they have. Uh, they're also wildly creative. Uh, they have a tendency to Superman or Wonder Woman all the time, and they do everything on their own, but inside they desire for community. Mm -hmm. It's very hard for them to show their soft underbelly. It's hard for them to show where their Achilles heel might be. And so there's this tension of, I want to be with people, but wouldn't it be better if I just Supermaned? all the time because it feels safer, uh, quick-witted, uh, and a strong intuition gain. So in as much as there's natural talent there, uh, they also recognize the gift of intuition to help them unpack where opportunity might live. And I'm, I'm happy to share with you the link to um, to uh, what all the, the 14 traits are, but that's that's a sampling. Well, it sounds to me, correct me if I'm wrong, it sounds to me like these people often wear out their welcome really quickly. And they that <laughs> they're, they're in constant transition from yeah. one job to the next. And, and so how they define their career, it becomes a real problem for them because they're, they're never stable it, it never feels like they're stable or in one place because they're always in transition it, am i correct in that yeah for some of them that that is certainly true and and i think you put that well is that for whatever reason they wear out their welcome to to give you my specific example um it wasn't that my creativity or my desire to um, to create something new or to lean into something new. Or what I like to say is if my job description was in the shape of a square, I'd try to turn it into a circle or a triangle. It's not that those ideas were never welcome. It's how good are you at reading the room? How good are you at creating community with the people on the other side of the table? How good are you at um, clarifying what you see as opportunity in your mind's eye and aligning that with that which is most important to a leader, a team, or whomever. And so the, the, the way that you're seen as just right as opposed to too much is um, slow down to speed up, as my coach likes to tell me. Is read the room. You're it's like I said, it's not the ideas are bad. It's how do you get people so excited about an idea or an opportunity? They'll say, Well, I know, I know that this is what you think the opportunity is. I'm going to I'm going to one up you and say, no, it's not this big. It's actually this big. So having people add on to what you're envisioning because they get so excited about it, that is the desired end state. And so people are excited about the idea, not distracted by who you are as a person or how you might express yourself as a person. It, it would it would seem that one of the, the great challenges then is for how these these people who I would suspect have a lot of energy, how they are uh, viewed by their supervisors, their, their, the people who are uh, their managers, you know, particularly if they're kind of in the middle 
middle of a, of a corporation, you know, and they're at that stage of their career where they're advancing and, and maybe they, they bump into a, a manager who is, who likes everything to be very orderly and structured. And yeah. this, and this person with all this energy and this creativity arrives in their life and it's become very disruptive. So, so what does, what does a person who's in that situation do? The, uh, the leader or the person who is the badass? The badass. Uh, um, one of the things that I love to do early on in a coaching engagement, and it's not like I've invented this, but it's it's shocking to me how, how often we don't have these reflections, is let's get crystal clear on what your most important values are. Let's get crystal clear about the environments where you can feel like you. Um, and once we're clear on what your most important values are, so for me specifically, freedom, truth, justice, creativity, and loyalty. If I'm in an environment or on a project or what have you that doesn't align with my key values, that's where distractions live. Um, also where conflict lives. Also the feeling like uh, that you're rudderless. And so if we were in environments that were aligned with what our important values are, if we were doing work aligned with what our important values are, then it doesn't matter if you're the loudest person in the room or the smartest person in the room, you belong in the room. Mm -hmm. And so uh, it is tempting to believe that badasses are all extremely loud. I also classify Ruth Bader Ginsburg as, as a badass. And again, you know, her politics are different from, from other people's politics, and that's fine. I'm not looking to make this political. She was soft-spoken and a huge disruptor, a yeah. huge disruptor. Uh, and so I, I think about all types of people in their disruption. How do they find places so that they had the most impact? Uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg should not was not working in a law firm. She was working in a nonprofit and that's how she was able to go in front of the Supreme Court as often as she did. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Steve Jobs had to leave Apple he was invited to leave. <laughs> Steve Jobs was invited to leave Apple. And then in a very interesting turn of events, the company that he creates next is acquired by Apple. And it was, he was a different Steve Jobs. He had a different perspective. He was in an environment that felt more like him. And Lo and behold, the the iPod, the iPhone, the all the things that he was able to put his fingers on before he passed away. The it's the these are amazing stories, and I and I I would suspect, correct me if I'm wrong, that one of the even as they're badass and they're they're constantly setting the bar higher and higher, and they're drawing a line in the sand that we're not going to go but or daring people to cross that line. And at another level, there is some kind of respect that's happening there where the person who is maybe feels in opposition, though, if they're doing their, their work, they get brought into the picture and, they're, and, it, and there's a co some collaboration that can happen. And I guess that's where I'm really going with this, is how does the badass build partners, collaborative partners in their endeavors and their their sense of uh, project mission? Yeah, thank you for asking. That's a great question. So as a build on top of getting crystal clear on what your ideal values are, and again, I did not invent this as an idea, but it's, it's, uh, it's again, it's shocking to me that we don't explore this enough, is share who you are as a person with the people on the other side of the table or the person on the other side of the table and get curious about what their important values are. I, it's, it's amazing to me that executive teams don't take the time to crystallize team values. 
and it doesn't have to be uh, team values that look like participation trophies where everyone's individual key value is part of the team values is if an executive team had a values exercise where everyone shared that which was most important to them, and then they crystallized a complementary team value set, then whatever strategy you develop aligned with the team value set. Uh, whatever interim milestone steps in service of the strategy they identify aligned with the team value set. And so you and I share our individual values. Then I know how to meet you where you are and you know how to meet me where I am. So we minimize conflict. We minimize misunderstandings because we are aligned in service of whatever that goal is. And so we don't get distracted uh, by assumptions because we have eliminated any kind of assumption. I know who you are and you know who I am and we are aligned together in service of the goal. I identify very, very, uh... Here, clearly, I identify personally with what you're describing, that that sense of being the disruptor, being a person who's always bringing the new ideas to it. So that's been the course of my career. And I, and mm -hmm. I reached the point when I realized I could no longer um, work for someone because I was mm -hmm. always going to be viewed as a threat to them. Yeah. So, so yeah. Mm -hmm. how, do you, how do you talk with your clients? Mm -hmm. who are who have spent their career in a corporate environment and and it becomes clear that it's probably time for them to move out of that structure into a structure where they are the one who is primarily responsible for the whole what how do you how do you talk with your clients in that way oh you know it's i've i've had any number of those conversations as you might imagine and it's so, it's so sensitive. It's actually, they're very painful conversations to have, not because I'm telling them that they don't fit. Uh, it's more, it's more an exploration around, are you happy? It feels very squishy. And I, I think squishy conversations, especially within the context of coaching, can be fraught with danger. Yeah. Uh, uh, so it's it's how you explore the are you happy conversation within the context of exactly what I just said, an exploration as opposed to, I believe you're not happy, let's find ways for you to navigate out of it is what makes you feel happy or what would make you feel happy? What would what would feel like, um, I'm sure you've read the book, The Big Leap by Gay Hendricks. Gay Hendricks yeah. talks about Einstein time in the book about, you know, doing, spending a minute doing something you don't like feels like a million years, but a million years with the person you love feels like a minute. Uh, exploring what Einstein time would be for them yeah. is what's that thing that would make you feel elevated? What's that thing that is the highest and best use of your time and talent? And it can be, it can be risky and painful because they get to a point where they say, this might not be my place. That's an amazing point to reach. I've seen that in, in my work. Um, and in, in my book, Circle of Impact, I, I tell, the first story I tell in there is about a, a man named William. He, he goes to work for a corporation out of college. He spends 25 years with them and then realizes that he can't move move with the company to Europe. It, he His job is going to take transport him to Europe, and he can't do that because of family consideration. So he has to leave the company. And mm -hmm. in the discussion that happens, he realizes that he has adopted the value system of the company as his value system. And so now mm -hmm. he, in his mid-40s, is at that point where he has to really discover his own set of values. Mm. And through that is this liberation that comes. And um, and I'm sure that this is the 
is the real payoff or the real uh, real payoff for you is when you see your your clients reach that point of kind of feeling liberated to go be who they truly want to be. And um, there's there's really nothing better than that, is there? Oh, my goodness. Uh, it There is one client in particular. Um, I don't want to divulge to it. I, 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 have, I have a strong value around confidentiality. No, so yeah, I, don't, I, I don't want you to repeat oh, it too much. It's, it's more of the, uh, I'll put it this way. This, this person leaned into their artistic gifts that they had set aside for so long uh -huh. and giving themselves permission to express through their artistic gifts. Uh, it was like a, like a reawakening and that that was, I, my mind was blown. Like I had no notion that this person had this gift until they divulged it to me. Uh, and, and then I saw and experienced some of the work and I said, oh my goodness, this, is, this has been in hiding. I think this explains a lot of people out there who have artistic an artistic side to them that, um, that has been ignored or squelched or suppressed because mm -hmm. the structure of the work that they've been doing does not really allow for that to come out. And yeah. So I think I think it's I think it's a cool it's a cool thing. So you uh, you have this thing called six sense uh, strategy. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Uh, what is what is that strategy? What tell us about what this strategy that you have that you have this this uh, cool little word S I X E N S E six cents. Uh, I, I really like that. Uh, tell us about that. Uh, so six cents strategy is the name of my practice, and it really speaks to how I am a left brain person, a right brain person, and also someone very much uh, driven by my intuition. So six cents, as you might imagine, is a contrived word of sixth and sense. Right. And uh, in in my corporate life. Uh, because I am that badass person in my corporate life, there was nothing better than standing in front of a whiteboard. And actually in my current advisory and executive coaching life, there's nothing better than standing in front of a whiteboard and saying, what's next? What can we create next? Wouldn't it be cool if blank? What would happen if we created blank? So I am very much someone who likes to talk about creating and manifesting opportunity. And as part of that, uh, I developed some IP called the Sixth Sense Empathy Model. And that is essentially turning empathy into an acronym and creating an approach for leaders to use as they are trying to be deliberate in terms of whatever it is that they would like to bring to market where it's an actual product, a service, a little bit of both, or what have you. And it's predicated very much on the idea of empathy. Uh, and as you know, empathy is not sympathy. Uh, sympathy is a little judgy. Empathy is I'm, I'm walking this path along with you. And so if we were truly empathetic as leaders, if we brought that to the fore, if we said that was the most important skill, even, even place it at higher importance than our natural skills, how much more aware would we be as leaders, not only in terms of our clients, uh, but how much more aware would be, we be as leaders of the people on our teams? And so when we keep empathy at the core of whatever strategy that we are contemplating or whatever goal that we might have in mind, uh, it, my belief is that we go further faster uh, when we place empathy at the core of the work that we do. What would you, what would you say are the kind of the standard obstacles to being empathetic? Oh, well, the thank you for asking. The So the first letter in the model, uh, E, is ego kills empathy. 
<laughs> so uh, we are, yeah. we are, yeah. we we are one hundred percent get in our own way. So the some of the traits that I was telling you before about badasses, about being Superman or Wonder Woman instead of uh, Clark Kent or Diana Prince, is when we when we stop believing we're the smartest person in the room or when we start realizing we are not the smartest person in the room and we invite the creativity of other people and we invite the experiences of other people and we invite the innovative ideas of, of other people into the conversation, then whatever minuscule idea we have becomes 10X, 20X or 30X. But we don't get there until we let go of the idea of rightness, until we let go of the idea of I must Superman all the time or I must Wonder Woman all the time. So so have you watched the uh, any of the TV series Ted Lasso? I have. Yes, it's a great show. It, it really is. I just finished watching the third season and uh, I'm back, now back watching. I'm going to watch the whole thing all, all together. What strikes me is that um, this this football team, this English football team that Ted has come to coach is full of a bunch of badasses and mm -hmm. they don't necessarily get along well. And mm -hmm. then here comes this coach and he's he's treating them different than what they expect the coach to do. So what, what do you see there that is maybe would be a good uh, kind of rule of thumb for us um, as we as we deal with the people in our own worlds as yeah. uh, as coaches, ourselves as coaches or as, as players on a team. Right, absolutely. So a couple of things come to mind. Uh, this idea of mastery as opposed to performance. Hmm. So uh, in many sports teams, uh, as you know, as, as well as other teams in life, even corporate life, uh, there are people that want to showboat or there are people that can't help but showboat. And they will always, they'll always get the girl at the end. Uh, they'll always, they'll always be the hero. They'll always be the heroine, but, but that's not necessarily to the benefit of everybody else. And so how do we create an environment of community as opposed to showboating? Uh, and so that's that's something that once badasses lean into community and, and realize that we all have our gifts that we bring to the table to become stronger as a unit. And at the same time, the people that lead badasses who might not be badasses themselves realize that there are beautiful, unique gifts that badasses can bring to the table and not clip their wings as they are part of this group then something really powerful happens in community. The, the other thing that, that comes to mind is, um, you know, a, an alignment of what the, higher, uh, what the higher goal might be, that we are all in agreement on what the higher goal is. And when we're all in agreement of the higher goal, we're not paying attention to individual performance we're paying attention to mastery as a unit. We're paying attention to individual mastery, how that serves group mastery or team mastery in service of the goal. And so what I mean by mastery is ultimately what a growth mindset is. It's the iteration. It's iterate, iterate, iterate. It's not that I haven't done something. It's that I haven't done it yet. Uh, that every outcome is perfect. And uh, there's, it's not that once we've hit a particular goal, then we're done. And, you know, thanks for coming my TED talk. It's okay, now I've done that. What else? What else? What else? Again, all in service of the community that we're in, and also in service of the goal that we have in mind. So mastery and alignment, that's that's what I would offer to you as observations. As you describe that, it it just it brings to mind the question of uh, uh, which I think is it, it's a hard it's it's a hard question to, not to ask, but it's a hard question to answer. Uh, for all of us, which is, well, in this day and age, what does it, what does it mean to be a leader? What's, mm. what's leadership today? 
And uh, I mean, that's my that's my area. But I, I'm curious if it, how you how you define leadership in the context of the work that you do. Oh, whew, deep question. Uh, I'll tell you what my spirit said to to answer is when we step into fully who we are unapologetically that I I am in alignment with my values. I am clear with what my values are, not only for my own sake, but for the sake of the communities that I choose to be in. And also I am in alignment that I want to hear what your key values are so that I can be supportive of you in whatever it is that you are creating in this world. Uh, and, it, and, and it could be, there's a risk when we are fully in alignment in our values that we may be standing next to someone who may find us polarizing. We may stand next to someone who we may not be their cup of tea and how we are at peace with that and still move forward in alignment with our values. And, and when I say polarizing, it's not because I've committed a crime or I've stolen from someone or something significantly worse, is that we may feel differently about the same thing. We may view some, the same thing differently and being at peace with the fact that not only may someone not agree with me, but may even disparage me. Will I be okay with someone doing that? Yes. What you what you describe is is the way I view things, and you know one of the ways I've come to talk about that is that for a person to be in a leadership role um, nowadays requires them to be the facilitator of other people's leadership. Yeah, and which I think is another way of talking about the types of things that you're doing. In your coaching work, and and I I think that's really um, very important. I think it's a very it's a great there's a great need for this. Um, there's a lot of people who who seek out coaches because they feel comfortable in a coaching relationship. But I think yeah. it sounds like you're the people that you're trying to reach are people that not would not necessarily or ordinarily go looking for a coach, but who may need it more than anyone else. Yeah, that's certainly true. Some of them have been hand raisers and, and that, you know, it's attributed to Einstein. We don't actually know if you said it, doing the same thing over again and expecting a different result. There, there are some that have reached out to me because they want to be seen for who they are without feeling like they need to change to be palatable to for someone else. How, how do they create that for themselves? And in many instances, uh, there are companies that retain me because they believe so powerfully in this person that they, they want to help this person create situations where they are better understood. So and it's it, they have powerful sponsors or, or there's someone that believes in their gift and they don't believe in throwing the baby out with the bathwater. And at the same time, if if whatever it is goes uh, unaddressed or untended, then you're going to start having people leave the company or there might be, you know, there might be some other sort of attrition if you don't address um, how that leader is showing up in that environment. So I've, I've had it. I've had it uh, in in a couple of different ways that I've had people approach me. That's great. Uh, I, I I see that as well. I see that as well. Well, let me ask you one last question. And and so for speak to those people who who may feel like they're always being disruptive, not intentionally, but people feel like they have strong ideas and they have lots of energy and they feel like they're constantly creating turmoil within the team or within the company. So what is the what is the first thing that they need to think about or do um, when they recognize that this is kind of the place that they're in? Hmm, that's a really good question. 
this will seem like an odd uh, an odd answer is uh, forgive yourself mm. uh, because they are hardest on themselves. They're harder on themselves than they are on anybody else. So how do we give ourselves grace and space and say, it's okay, mainly because they're not the only person in the world who's felt that way. They are in good community. They are an excellent company. And then the, the second thing I would offer to them as reflection is what's important to you? Why are these things or what about these things are important to you? And how do you create the conditions so that you're always in spaces doing or touching the things that are important to you. Mm -hmm. But the, the first thing is grace. It is, um, it is so hard for these high performer disruptor types to forgive themselves and to give themselves a pass. They'll do it for other people. They won't, they won't ever do it for themselves. I totally agree. Totally agree. Well, this is fantastic. I love the work that you're doing. I think it's really important. And um, and folks, if you're if you see yourself in this kind of place in your life, maybe you should be reaching out to Parissa and having a conversation about maybe how she can help you um, navigate this situation that you find yourself in. There are a lot of us who have been there, and we a lot of us had to learn without any help. Well, if you can get some help, I think it's really a valuable thing to do because it will accelerate accelerate your own transition to where you want to be. So, thank you, Parissa, for being here. Uh, mm -hmm. We'll uh, we'll put all the information that we need to uh, help people find you. Uh, and we'll do that in the show notes. And and uh, thank you for coming on. And I uh, thank you all for watching this episode of the Eddie Network podcast. We'll see you again soon. Bye bye. Thank you.